When I was a high school student, I lived in Colombia, and the mountains there are amazing. But one time we were traveling from Colombia to Ecuador, and as we were going through the mountains, we were going through a place, I don't think I'd ever seen snow-capped mountains before. But as we were entering Ecuador, and I don't really, I have no idea where we were in the, mil, in the, in the drive, I remember the sky being amazing. It was so lit up. I think it was sunset. And it was, but it was so bright and so amazing that the caravan of people, there were a number of cars traveling with us to Ecuador, that even, you know, cell phones weren't in play, but everyone was so in awe of the beauty of both so, snow-capped mountains and the sun that just kind of lit up the sky, that without talking, all these cars just pulled over. And we just sat there and just stared at the sky in awe. You know, I didn't even want to leave. This is a teenage boy. They're not known much for appreciating beauty. But I remember just being in awe of this wonder, this creation that God had made. Psalm 19 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. Night after night they pour forth speech. They're declaring His goodness, His wonder. There's no one like Him. No one makes a place like this. The best artist in the world is at best copying His work. The heavens declare the glory of God. But I thought about this as it relates to our study. If creation is like this, what will it be like to see its maker face to face? What we've been looking at is this displacement from Eden, our longing for Eden, our desire to be at a place that is not broken, that is not twisted, that is not depraved. Eden was God's creation. God made the world it very good. He declared it very good. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden to steward and to provide and to cultivate the garden. And they had immediate access to God, but there was one thing they couldn't do. They couldn't eat from this specific tree. They could eat from everywhere else. But the second that they ate, they rebelled against God as king. They were vice regents, and the, the, the consequence was, was huge. Sin enters their story. There was a time when humans were innocent without sin without shame. And what happens is the tragedy of Eden is this. This rejection of God resulted in a rebellion. They rebelled against God. There's this division that came into the story that did not exist. Shame replaced innocence and freedom. And then there's human alienation. First there was this separation between God and man. Sin pushed us away from God. But then there's this blame shifting, man versus woman. The woman you gave me. There's this turn, like it's her fault. But then there's also self-deceit, man and woman against themselves. They, they are denying in their own role and what they did. But then the created order itself is even cursed. Death enters a story that was not there before. Spiritual and physical death enters the struggle of human life. Probably the biggest loss was they lost immediate access to God. God pushes them out of the garden, and, and then He curses the, the earth, and it's a toil. Instead of it being a, a place that they didn't have to labor like this, there are all these consequences that follow. But then God turns to the one who actually deceived uh, Eve, and he, he, says, he pronounces judgment on Satan as who it is. And He says, one, someone who's coming is, gonna, is ultimately going to crush your head. You're going to contend with him. There's going to be enmity between him. But there's someone who is coming who's going to crush your head. On the heels of the fall, where God is rightly and justly pronouncing judgment for a rebellious people, he's promising that someone is coming who will fix it. There's a, a, a king who's coming. Someone who is righteous and who is good. And what we saw last week was this righteous king was tempted, just like Adam and Eve, and yet he doesn't fall. We see him with authority to bind Satan. In casting out demons, he's declaring that I am here, I'm, I'm in charge, and you are not. And it's a glimpse of what is ultimately to come. What we'll see today are, are three things. First, kind of echoes of Eden. As we see this promised king, this righteous king, as his ministry is unfolding on earth, we see um, just echoes of Eden, of what it looks like when it was like it was back at, at the creation. 
Second, we see the final Eden. We see a promise of this Eden that is to come, a place where we have access to God and more. And then finally, we see this garden in between. There's a cost to this restoration. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke 7, verses 1 through 17. This said in, in Jesus' ministry as it's unfolding. After he had finished all his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a certain servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he had, was not far off from the house, a centurion sent friends, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. Verse 8 says this, For I too am a man uh, set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I'll tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Verse 11 says that soon afterwards he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd for the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and touched her. The buyer and the, the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him, gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Pray with me. Father, as we look at your word, I pray that you'd help us to long for Eden more. That as we see the righteous king entering and doing ministry, we get these glimpses of Eden as it should be. Just glimpses at that point in his ministry. But yet we long for the day when you will make all things new. So Lord, I pray that you would give hope where it's needed to people. And yet that you'd help us to appreciate better where we are in history. We're between the times. Things have not all been made well, but yet we have these glimpses in, in history and even in our own lives today of how you are restoring this world and ultimately your promises you will make all things new. So Lord, teach us today. I pray that your spirit would move far more than, than I could do. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The first point I want you to see is echoes of Eden. Echoes of Eden. Basically, as the promised king ministers, there are these glimpses of the reversal of the fall. Look at verses 18 through 20. This follows the context we just saw where God, Jesus heals from distance. He raises a person from the dead. This is what it says in verses 18 through 20. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling to his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? What's crazy about this is John is the forerunner to the Messiah. God raises John up to prepare the way for Jesus' arrival. And yet he is put in jail. If you look in uh, Luke 3, 15-20, you can see the account where he is actually locked up for his faithfulness. So John is calling out what is sin in the, in the world, and he's locked up. The consequence is that. And so what's crazy is that John is sending his disciples. John has been really influential, and he's sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? This is the one who's telling everyone who is to come. He says, or shall we look for another? Who are you? Is there more? Look at verses 21 through 23 now. In that hour, Jesus, it says he, Jesus healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, lame walk, 
lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. In that hour, Jesus heals many. There are these reversals of the fall. If you look at Eden, it would look more like this. Blind receive their sight. The consequence of, of sin, not by, directly. It's not like a person who's born blind or is blind now. Is It's because of their immediate sin. But the effects on the broken world is this. Now we have disease. Now we have blindness. Now there's deafness. Now there's this loss of the world as it should be. The blind receive their sight. Lame walk. Lepers, their skin diseased, are, are cleansed. The deaf can hear. The dead are kind of our greatest enemy that we think of as human beings are raised. And the poor are hearing the good news preached to them. And then what he says, Jesus says something. So this is reply. It's like, look at what's happening. Tell John what's happening, actually. Go and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. As they're looking at what's happening... There's this reversal of the consequences of the fall for a season. And he says, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. His reply is really, I am the promised one. Take a look. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't let your personal predetermined expectations make you miss Jesus. The scoreboard, as we saw last week, says winning. You don't understand everything that's going on. We don't understand everything that's going on. But what Jesus says on this day is, take a look. It's just the glimpse. These are just echoes of Eden. But He is winning. For us, our unmet expectations can drive us to despair or to dependence. Don't allow your unmet expectations to overwhelm your recognition of the goodness of God. John felt this. He'd seen God at work in his life, and yet the, the situation of his, his situation did not pan out like he expected. And that undercut his, his recognition of what was pretty obvious, that the king was there. And God had made himself known. He hadn't changed his mind. This was the king, despite the broken world that was still there. There are these glimpses of the reversal of Eden all around this man, Jesus. Hebrews 11, 13-16 describes this as kind of the normal experience of the believer in the fallen world. Uh, if you, you can see the context in, in, in Hebrews 11 for yourself. But at, at verse, beginning at verses 13-16 says this, all, uh, These all died in faith. It, it has like a reference of all these people who have been faithful and believed throughout time. Believers in history. It says, All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to call to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. They didn't experience a restored world. They looked forward to one that was coming. The second point I want you to see is a country just beyond the horizon. A country just beyond the horizon. This was written, this is Revelation 21, if you turn there with me. Revelation 21. It was written to a struggling first century Christianity, the early church, uh, but it gives hope for us as well. A country just beyond the horizon. Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 21. John has this vision of what's to come, and he says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. There's this new heaven and new earth that is coming. It will be free from the bondage of decay. If you look in Romans 8, verses 20-23, through 23, it says this, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage of corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Now, the, the earth has been... It has a curse on it. It's really good. So I would just want to say that in the middle of the fact that the world really is broken and there's real brokenness, even in the physical order of things, it's also still structurally very good. So I think you, we're not to like despise the earth and hate it. 
In fact, we just read earlier Psalm 19, or discussed Psalm 19, where the heavens declared the glory of God. So there's this greatness about the world that's still intact. We're supposed to appreciate all that God has given that is good, and to, to receive them with thankfulness. So it's not that the world itself is is completely evil. That's not true. In fact, we're supposed to stand in awe of Him because of His creation. But the world is expecting and longing for a day that is made new, where death and disease is not a thing, that it's gone. The bondage of decay, free from decay, a world without decay. It is a place where righteousness dwells. 2 Peter 3.13 says this, But according to His promise, we're waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The place, this new heaven and new earth, is a place where righteousness dwells. How great would it be to never have to lock your doors ever again? Not because you just don't care, there are people who do that, but because you just, you know it's safe. No one's going to do anything. A place where righteousness dwells. Look at verse 2 of chapter 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. God's new creation is beautiful. He references as a bride, a wife of the Lamb, carefully prepared and treasured. Revelation 21.9 says this, uh, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The new Jerusalem is both a redeemed people and a place. It's a prepared bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then heaven is seen coming down to earth now. When I think about just a prepared bride, I remember a guy named Ben McNeil. Hello, Ben, if you end up seeing this later. But I went to a friend of mine to his wedding. And I remember so vividly when Robin, his wife, entered his sight. And I watched Ben see his bride. And Ben nearly passed out. I respect you for that, Ben. But... The deal is he was so in awe of this prepared bride, so in awe that he would even have access and have this, this gift, this treasure, that, that he nearly passed out. Scripture references the church in this, this prepared place as something God has been intentional about. Heaven is a prepared place. That it's now it's coming down to earth. Look at verse 3 now. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Face to face. Think of Eden. They had access. Well, one day, what's coming is unhindered access to God himself. Scripture says that God dwells with man. The dwelling place of God is with man. I think of a family. I mean, same thing like a bride. Like we have that in our in our in our fellowship, where we have people who are being married, and they're going to move, and and now this person is going to become their family. God dwells with them in the future. This is what's to come. It references the one who overcomes is will be my son. There, there's this family relationship. There's face-to-face -face access, but the believer has access and relationship with God Himself. It says God will be their God. He will be their God. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says this, For now we see a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know, I shall know fully, even as I've been fully known. 1 John 3, 2 says this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. I love what Martin Luther says. I would not give one moment of heaven for all the joy and the riches of the world, even if it lasted for thousands and thousands of years. I think Martin Luther has a glimpse of what is to come. A recognition that heaven is going to be completely amazing. When I think of this, this created time, looking at the sky in Ecuador, in these mountains, and the one who made that, that just made... like. Blew my mind as a teenager. He's making all things new and he's trying. All things are made new. We're made for this access to God. We will see him face to face. Look now at verse 4. 
He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. God Himself, the language says, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's this intimacy, this closeness of Him wiping every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Death is so foreign, so common, but so foreign. It's like, why is it like this? The fall. The world is broken. Mourning, crying, and pain will be no more. This isn't just a hope, a pipe dream. This is a promise of the living God who conquered the grave. Mourning, crying, and pain will be no more. Verse 5 says this, And he who seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God is making all things new. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love Him. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love Him. God is going to make all things new. Look at verse 6. And He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The thirsty, God will give from the water of life without payment. This is a picture of grace. It's completely unearned. This is a kingdom. God's kingdom is a kingdom of unfit people. People who don't deserve to be there. There's not a single person in heaven who deserves to be there in their own work. So He's going to satisfy them freely. It's the picture of grace. I love what John Newton said. He, John Newton is the one who wrote Amazing Grace. But he was also a slave trader. Listen to his words. He, and one day totally regretted that life. But he says this, If I ever reach heaven, I expect to find three wonders there. First, to meet some I had not thought to see there. Second, to miss some I expected to see there. And third, the greatest wonder of all, to find myself there. This is a slave trader who becomes a believer, and his heart is changed. He hates that. He writes the, the song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The song goes on, written by a former slave trader. The people who are in heaven don't deserve to be there. The people who have access to God don't deserve to be there. He's going to make all things new, heaven and earth, and they'll actually come together. Revelation 21, verses 22 through 27. Go there, if you would, turn. It says this, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They they will bring into, the, into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does, does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only the redeemed. Only those who put their trust in Christ. Revelation 1 says this, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings on the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us, from our sin by His blood. This righteous King lays down His life for an unfit people. The gates will never be shut. It's this picture of peace. No locks. It's safe. You pull up the gates at night in the darkness because there's no light, right? And this isn't like lit up city. It was first century stuff. And they're thinking. But they don't have to put the gates up. Nothing unclean will ever enter, enter it. It's a good place. It's a place without sin. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be there. Those who have at some point in their life have trusted in the finished work of the Savior. Finally, look at Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. This is a picture of the final Eden. These are images, right? So it's, there is some, some space to think through this. But the, he's meaning to communicate 
uh, there's some symbolic language it amounts to. The angel showed, us, showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God, and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit. No longer will there be any, anything accursed, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The river of the water of life. This is language from Eden. And it flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. The tree of life. This is eternal life. That existed in Eden. It's no longer accursed. It's not a cursed place anymore. And again, it says they will see his face and that his name will be on their foreheads. It's the people of God. That's who's here. I like what Stephen Whitmer says. Finally, the effects of the fall will be reversed and God's people will be returned to his presence. Exile will be over. But John's vision suggests that the new creation is even better than Eden, the first one. There are two trees of life, not one. This paradise lasts forever, rather than ending abruptly with a fall into sin. And the Lamb will be present as the focus of eternal worship. A forever home where time is no longer an issue. For us, as a supply, our longing for Eden can and will be satisfied. Those who are in Christ, an unfit kingdom, a people who don't deserve to be there, but who have trusted in the finished work of Christ, are made a family. And will be with Him forever. Our longing for Eden can and will be satisfied. Second, our restoration cost our sinless King His life. I like what Eric Sauer says, From paradise to paradise, such is the path of mankind according to God's all-loving plan, created for life and prosperity, for peace and joy. Man longs to return to the gates of his homeland. But between the gates of the first and the second paradise stands the mediator, the man from heaven, the man Christ Jesus, the Savior of the world. Between the garden of the first and the second paradise, there lies another, that quiet garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where in sternest struggle for you and me, Jesus sought the face of his Father. Look at the passage that kind of gives an account in Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. It's talking about Jesus in the garden before he will ultimately die for his people. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's, stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. He knows what's to come in some significant ways. Um, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now get... Jesus is functioning as a real man. He's God the Son on the earth. And so he feels the real weight of what's to come as a human being. So it says, Not my will, but yours be done. Verse 43, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. Verse 44 says this, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He burst vessels in his head, and he starts to bleed because the stress was so much. He says, Not my will, and you'll be done. And then when he rose from prayer, he, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We see this garden in between, where our king labors on behalf of us. The weight is so heavy, and yet he obeys the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8 says this, this Paul, who is again a guy who hated Christianity, he ultimately becomes one of its chief voices, writes this, I deliver to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ, this promised Redeemer, died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. This was the plan. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This was the plan. He was going to be raised. And that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Christians are unfit 
for the kingdom, but they've been made fit by the righteous king. A final story that I think is a great picture of the life in between, in between the times, between these two Edens. As we live in this world, we have this real promise of this coming day when all things will be made new. We long for this place where it's, it's not broken, where there's no division, where there's no hatred, where there's no ugliness, where there's no sin, where your sin is not here, where we're not dealing with our own sin, and yet we have access with God face to face. Dr. Logan Carson was the first full-time African-American professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He also happened to be born blind. He died on November 3rd, 2018, and this was written by a girl who was directly impacted by his ministry and his life. She writes this, My heart is tender today and it catches me. But because silence is my only real job for this minute, I let them fall. It is in this blessed reprieve of noise that my tears bring clarity. You see, my husband and I lost someone dear to us this week. Dr. Carson was a seminary professor who employed us both and then watched gleefully as we chose each other. He grinned all the way to the altar less than a year later where he performed our simple and joy-filled wedding ceremony. I know all the ways he touched our individual and collective lives, and the list is longer than my arm. He was another parent to me when my parents were a day's drive away. His lack of physical sight never stopped him from truly seeing me and sharing what he saw. I was his cook. He was my counselor, professor, and friend. Each night I prepared his dinner before I went home to my apartment and roommates. Before I left, his hand inevitably shot in the air and he would pray for me, always beginning with the words, listen to this, kind. Father, bless this girl. When our paths diverged, Lance and I were parents ourselves, and he was past 80, still speaking words of wisdom and praise. Last Saturday in a coffee shop in Greenville, South Carolina, I received the news. Leaving an empty shell behind, he stepped right into the presence of God with his eyes that saw clearly for the very first time. In the moments that followed the email, I felt relief and complete joy. This is absolutely the greatest and best new adventure for him, and I know he has been waiting for this day. Still this week, I have felt a heaviness I could not ignore. In the library runs and ballet drop-offs and lunch making, there, was, there has been a weight around my heart that feels like homesickness. I am fairly certain that is exactly what it is. But not until I stand chopping potatoes, listening to the first moment of true silence in my day, do I recognize that I am grieving. The last few years, I have kept Lance and I just distanced enough from him that I feel like I'm not entitled to my grief. This grief that, keeps up, that creeps up on me while I chop potatoes, remember how he liked his potatoes every Thursday evening, roasted and browned with bits of onion. I recall that he had more knowledge of the Bible than any sight-blessed person ever, and also a talent for making homemade lemonade. I feel silly in my sadness because I know just how healed happy he is. I know my sadness is not for him, but for all of us still on this side of the door. To turn my heart, I turn to old emails, and there it waits for me, written in 2007, words that are somewhat prophetic from my dear Dr. Carson. Dr. Carson writes this, I'm getting ready to set my house in order, preparing for my last days on this earth. I'm as happy as a sunbeam, for soon I shall be with Jesus. I'm going to take time to be holy and serve as best as I can for the next couple of years. I will always be your friend. It is to my joy that you met the man you're about to wed, met him officially here at my home. I like what Dr. Uh, Aiken said in referencing Dr. Carson. He says this, The thing I remember most about Dr. Carson is that he said he didn't want his sight back in this life. Because the first thing I want to see is Jesus' face. The promise that is coming is that all things will be made new. And yet we see this picture of tension between death. We see death here. The death is foreign. And yet we know that all things will be made new. Those who are absent of the body are present with the Lord. And yet we long for Eden. We long for the day that everything is made new. That the world that we are experiencing right now is so chaotic and so broken and so divided and, and so many other things, sin-filled, 
It's a beautiful world, an amazing world that God has made, but we're between the times. My prayer is that, that God will take His Word and He will both give you hope and me hope for what is to come. That if you don't know Christ, that you will turn to Him and believe on this Savior. You get glimpses of His life, of this reversal of Eden, and then ultimately He dies on the cross for your sin and for mine. Everyone who trusts in this Savior King will be saved. I pray that you believe on Him, and I pray that if you know Him, that you will cling to this hope that He has given us, this promise that both all things will be made new and that you'll be with Him. You'll see Him face to face. One day, the believer will be with God forever, and time will not be a problem. Pray with me. Father, I thank You uh, for Your Word. I thank You for how You show us to live how to thrive in a world that we see that's really broken. You've explained where we are in the story, and yet you've given us this hope of this coming Eden. One day all things will be made new. The foreign feeling, the exile that we feel here will be gone. And yet the beauty that we know here too, the, the wonderful things of this earth, that they'll still exist and more and much, much better. How I pray that you would accomplish your plans and your purposes for this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Hope you have a blessed day.